So let me read to you from Romans 6, uh, verse 1 and following, and then we'll pray and then we'll study. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you, must, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we study your word tonight, that you bless our time that you would make clear to us your word, Lord, and that your Holy Spirit would work through this passage of Scripture, convicting us, forming us, and ultimately transforming us, changing us, so that we might become more like your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So Romans 6, this obviously touches on baptism, which is why we're continuing on from this morning's theme. Um, one of the things about baptism services is that because of all the baptizing we do, the sermon has to be a bit shorter, and I didn't quite get to say all the things I necessarily wanted to say. So this is an opportunity to fill in a few gaps um, and, to, um, and to clarify a few things. So, let's pick up in verse uh, 1 of Romans 6, just to bear in mind that this is, because we're focusing on baptism, I'm not going to take my normal exegetical approach, I mean I won't be quite as uh, careful over every last detail as I would normally be, Um, it's going to be a little bit more thematic, but nonetheless we will look over everything for context. So, When he says, what shall we say then? That is a response to what has been taught in chapter 5. And one of the key things that was taught in chapter 5 and where chapter 5 concluded, we can read together in verse um, 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The the process being spoken of in those verses is simply this. That law rules, as it were, commandments, they increase sin. In a sense, sin was already there. But when you have a command that says, do not sin, then now if you sin, you've broken that command. So you've now not only got the sin in your heart, you've got the breaking of that commandment. So if I say, don't walk on the grass, because walking on the grass there is causing damage, then when you were walking on the grass and causing damage, you were doing something wrong. But now I've put the rule up, do not walk on the grass. Now you're not only doing the grass harm and therefore, you know, in this analogy, you're not being very, uh, very careful or very loving, but now you've broken a specific rule. So that's the sense in which law increases sin. But the, the conclusion at the end of Romans 5 was that the more that sin increases, the more that grace increases too. And this is a broad principle that we have to be absolutely clear on. And that is, the more that we sin the more grace there is. If somebody comes to Christ, and they come to Christ having grown up in a Christian home, 
They come to Christ having never drunk, never sworn, never done all of these things that people you know, probably erroneously associate with righteousness. That They've just lived a really good life. They haven't stolen, they haven't cheated or haven't been violent. They've just, they've just been this goody two-shoes. And if a person comes to Christ with that background, they are still a terrible sinner, worthy of the wrath of God, who is completely reliant on the mercy of God to, to pay the price for their sin. That Christ's death was sufficient for the sin that they committed. That the grace that is available to them is sufficient for their sin. But if somebody comes to Christ and they have been the opposite, they have committed every sin you care to mention, they have sinned you know, consistently and fervently, they have been anti-God, they have hated people, they have only looked out for themselves, they have been violent, they have been whatever else, then somebody comes with a whole bunch more sin, then there is sufficient grace for them as well. It doesn't matter how much sin we have. That Christ's death is sufficient to pay the price for all of our sin. It doesn't matter if we, if we think, well, he's forgiven me for my sin. That's great. But now I'm a Christian. I've kept on sinning. What happens with those sins? His blood's sufficient for those sins. But I didn't just slip up. I deliberately went back to my sin. His blood is sufficient for those sins. You know, in fact, I became a Christian. After I became a Christian, I did some stuff that I didn't even do before I was a Christian. His blood is sufficient for those sins. No matter how much sin there is, there's always sufficient grace. When you increase sin, then grace increases even more. Now, there's far more to it in Romans 5, but that's the key point. And that is why in verse 1 of chapter 6... Paul says, but what shall we say then? Are we going to continue in sin that grace may abound? And this is a question that so many people have about the Christian faith from outside the Christian faith. And it's a, it's a question that so many young Christians have. And it's a question that, that strangely enough, many more people, I was going to say mature Christians, but that would perhaps defeat the definition. Christ, people who have been Christians for a lot longer and should know a lot better, they still have this same question. And the question is this, if whatever I do is going to be forgiven, it, does it matter if I sin? Does it matter if I continue to sin, if I keep on, if I keep on sinning, if I, you know, because, you know, you say, well, if, if, you, if you do this, oh, well, Jesus has got that covered. Well, I really shouldn't do this, but you know what? I'm a Christian. Jesus is going to forgive me. And so there is this, there is this potential loophole that we see. Where, where people who are Christians can just get away with murder, both literally and figuratively. And you see the criticism of this outside the church, where there'll be maybe somebody who'll get saved and they've led this horrifically bad life. There were some reports, for, for example, that one of America's most notorious serial killers and cannibal, Jeffrey Dahmer, that he converted to the Christian faith shortly before his death while in prison. I have no way of knowing if that's true or not. I've heard the tale from several um, different sources, but of course the sources come from other sources and they come from other sources, and it may well be an urban legend. But for argument's sake, let's presume it's true. A lot of people have issues with how on earth can he just sin and sin and sin and sin and sin, and then at the end of his life say, please forgive me, God, God forgives him and it's all okay. That's not fair. And the idea is that just when there's so much grace for so much sin, what does it matter if we sin? This leads non-Christians to thinking, well, I'll just sin and sin and sin and sin, and then when I get old, I'll come to Jesus and get forgiveness. And it leads people in the church to say, well, it doesn't matter if I keep sinning because God's got me. He's got my back. He's going to forgive me. And so that is the question that Paul is addressing in verse 1. And his answer in response to that question is by no means. That's a funny old translation. 
by no means sounds like something that I might have heard back in my homeland in England, maybe in one of the posher parts of London. You know, should I use the, should I use this fork with the meal? Oh, by no means, have this fork with it. It's like something out of Downton Abbey, isn't it? By no means, you know. No, 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 no. That's not what's trying to be communicated here. This in the original Greek is the strongest possible form of negation. It's the strongest way that you could possibly say no. So, so in English, we, if we say no, we have something negative, that's a negative, right? And then in English, we have something called a double negative, which is when the negative cancels itself out. So we might say, um, I, I, I won't never do that. You say, oh, so you might do it then, because the two negatives cancel out. But in most other languages, and certainly in Greek, you have a second negative, and it becomes stronger. And what happens here is that there is a construction where you have something that is very unlikely, maybe, but possible. And it, it's to say, you know, that this might possibly happen, and that's combined with a negative, and the idea is that, this, that there's just no possibility at all of this happening. So when he says by no means, he's saying, he's saying the, the, this isn't something that you should even be thinking about. This isn't something that should even be on your radar. This is the most ridiculous question. Of course the answer is no. How could it possibly be anything that no? And I could go off on various rants, quoting from various uh, contemporary culture or various ways of saying no um, strongly, but you get the gist. We have, we have a very, very strong way of saying, absolutely not, this is not even a possibility. That's what by no means means. So, and the, re and, and the explanation of that is another question, which is this. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Um, the idea is simply this, that, that if, you, if your relationship with sin has now died, how do you continue with that? It would be like somebody being married, and after a period of time, that person divorces. And then they go about their life for many more years. And then after another, I don't know, 10 years, they get remarried. And they're married for another 10 years. So let's, let's use 10 year multiples, make it easy. They get married for 10 years. They're divorced and then unmarried for 10 years, and now they get married to somebody else and they're married to the second person for another 10 years. And then they meet up with their ex-wife or ex-husband. And would it be appropriate for them to go and do spousey things? Of an of a emotional intimacy or a physical intimacy? Of course not, we would all say. That's just ridiculous. Of course they shouldn't do that. But they say, ba 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 ba, that's my, that's my spouse. It's like, no, 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 not anymore. That ended. That was cut off. There was a, there was a death of that relationship. It died. It no longer exists. And therefore, there is nothing now there. That ended 20 years ago. And so what Christians don't seem to understand so often is this, that what Jesus did in, on the cross was not giving us a get out of jail free card. He didn't say, oh, look at all these terrible sins. You're, you're going you, to get punished for that. Here, quick, have a get out of jail free card or get out of hell free card. And, and you just get on with your lives, la di da whatever. And, and then you just hand that in once you die. Once you die, you've got your card there in your back pocket, and you're going to be okay because all your sins are going to be forgiven. That is not the gospel. The gospel message is that sin is our master. People today think that they're free. In this country, people talk about freedom a lot. People are starting to discover what it's like when you lose those freedoms. I won't get distracted, don't worry. But nonetheless, 
People think that they're free, but the reality is, is that freedom is an illusion. When the average person says, I want to do this, so I'm going to do it because I'm free, that they're actually bound by their sinful nature. They will do the things they instinctively want to do because they're a sinner. Sin binds them. And when a person gets law, the law, as we saw in chapter 5, increases sin, but it makes them aware of it. So a person just goes about living their life, and then someone says, no, 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 that's sinful, that's wrong. And then this person is, ah, oh, oh, I shouldn't do this, this is wrong. And then we suddenly have this situation where, um, where they know something is wrong now, and what are they going to do? Are they going to stop doing it? Well, typically, there is still the inclination to do it because a person is still bound by sin. Sin is the master. Sin is in charge. People do what their sinful nature and their sinful desires tell them to do. And so, what is being said in the gospel is this. Your problem is not that you're going to be punished for sin. Your problem is that you're bound by sin. Sin controls you. Sin, sin makes you do things. Makes you do what, you in, what your selfishness wants, what your pride wants, what all these sinful inclinations want. And you are not free. You are chained to it and you're bound to it. And you can't be free from it. And the result of that is that you will be punished for your sin. The punishment for sin is not the problem. It's the ramification. It's the implication. It's the result. The problem is that you're bound to sin in the first place. That sin is your master. And so what is being said by Paul here is that we who are Christians have died to sin. That Jesus' death on the cross was not simply saying, you're forgiven, you're okay, don't worry about it. But it's saying you have a terrible problem that sin is your master. What I will do is pay the price to free you from sin so that I can be your master instead. We don't get to be free. We're not gods. We don't do what we want. We either bow the knee before sin or we bow the knee before God. And what Paul is saying to the Christian who might suggest he can continue sinning, continue sinning, continue sinning, because, hey, it's okay, I've got my get out of jail free card. There's always going to be more grace for that sin. Well, there will be more grace for that sin. But what you need to understand is, is that what Jesus has done is severed your relationship with sin. That you have now died to sin. And therefore, the power that sin had has been taken away. And so he explains this more fully. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Now the first thing I need to explain about this is simply this. That we've been having baptism service today and we've been talking about baptism all day. And as I mentioned very briefly in passing this morning, that when we are saved, when we become Christians, we are baptized into Christ, baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. There is an initiation. There is a moment when we're not a Christian and then we place our trust in God and then there's a moment when we are a Christian and we have been baptized into Christ. This I don't think is talking about water baptism. Water baptism, as we said today, is a, an, an act, a sign, like the wedding ring is a sign of being married. It's not, this isn't a marriage, this is a sign of a marriage. In the same way that the baptism is a sign of the spiritual baptism that's already occurred. And in that spiritual baptism, in that act of being saved, which baptism represents, we who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. In other words, when we become Christians, we become so associated with Christ that his death is our death and his resurrection is our resurrection. And when he died, he died a death for sin. 
And when we are associated with him, that death and that price is paid to our account. He receives the punishment that we should have received for our sin. And it goes upon him. So we are associated then in that death. And in that death, we die to sin, to our old life. That's now gone, that's now severed. What Jesus did, not just with the death, but more importantly, with the resurrection, is he showed victory over sin. We were buried, verse 4, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that... This is why we're associated with his death. This is why we're baptized into his death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. We die with him and we are raised with him. We die to sin and we are raised to a new life. That's the picture of baptism. The joy of the Christian message is not that we're simply forgiven because of our sins, forgiven for our sins. The joy of the Christian message is that we're free from sin. That is, that is night and day, folks. That is astonishingly important, and we must understand it. The Christian message is not merely that we are forgiven for our sins. The Christian message is that we're free from sin. You say, well, hold on a second. If you've been with me the last 24 hours, you might notice I'm not particularly free from sin right now. That's the problem that comes up with that. And Paul is going to deal with that for the rest of chapter 6 and the entirety of chapter 7. And that's beyond my scope tonight. I'm itching to teach Romans, but we're going to have to leave that for now. So, all I want to emphasize tonight is that the power of sin has been broken. And just as a person might be in a prison cell, and you might go up to that prison cell and you may unlock the door, they are now no longer locked in that cell. They can stand up, they can open the door, and they can walk out. They are no longer bound in that cell. They have been set free. But if they keep sitting in the same cell, and they never open the door, then you would never know that they've been set free. For us as Christians, there needs to be a recognition, an understanding, that we've been set free from sin. And Paul, as he goes on through this, this, this uh, next chapter and a half, he goes on and he explains the struggle that the Christian has, why sin continues, and how victory has been assured, and how we walk in that victory. Wouldn't that be a good series of sermons to do? Maybe another day. But he comes to the end of that whole section and he hits Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, a very well-known verse, which says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that is a, such a well-known verse, and, and most Christians know that verse. It's astonishingly well-known, and most Christians misunderstand that verse. They think that he's saying there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because your sins have been forgiven. No, no, he stopped talking about that in chapter 4, early chapter 5 maybe. No, 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 what he's saying here is, because you've been set free from sin, the struggle with sin that you have, there's now no condemnation. You are no longer condemned, as a Christian, to continue to live the same life that you lived before. And you can walk in a new life. Now, the, the explanation of all of that obviously is in a chapter and a half here and we won't go on forever but just to summarize a few key points from those chapters suffice to say that when you received Christ you received the Holy Spirit and you received a new nature but your old nature your sin is in your flesh so there is within you the Holy Spirit and there is within you still your flesh. 
Now, I'm just checking, I've still got both my arms. And I'm presuming because I'm standing up, I've got both my legs. So I still have my body. And my sinfulness is hardwired into my DNA. I am born a sinner and I'm going to die a sinner. Because this flesh is tainted irredeemably by sin. But what God has given me in Christ is his Holy Spirit, which gives me another nature, a new nature, through which I can operate. And that's what Paul goes on to deal with at the end of chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 8. Now they're great messages and they're great topics and they're ones for another day. But what we're looking at here in chapter 6 is this. That when Jesus dies and is raised again, that us who have believed in him, us who have trusted in him, that we in our baptism, spiritual in our faith, but, but in the, the symbolism of water baptism, that we who are, are baptized in Christ, we are associated with his death, death to our old life, and we're raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we too may walk in the newness of life. There is this promise for us of this opportunity to walk free from sin. That will ultimately be only fulfilled when this is gone. That's why Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 15 of the importance of the resurrected body. That one day when Christ returns, we won't be, we won't be existing in heaven forever. We're not going to be, you know, we leave our body behind and we go, we go to be with Christ when we die, if we believe. And we leave our bodies and we and our souls, we go to be with Christ. And some people think that's the end. Paul's emph absolutely emphatic. The Bible's emphatic that we will have, be, have new bodies. We will be raised from the dead like Christ was raised from the dead. But the new bodies that we have will be bodies that are no longer tainted by sin. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what it's going to be like to walk and talk without any effect of sin? No words that we speak will be hurtful to others. No, no actions that we do will be sinful. No thoughts that we have will be sinful. The struggles that we have the tendency we have to do the things that we know are wrong, the tendency we have to not do things that we know are right, they'll all be gone. We'll be completely free from sin. That's God's promise to us in Christ Jesus. So we have a starting point, being baptized into Christ Jesus, being saved, and we have an end point, which is when we return with Christ in glorified bodies. What happens in between? In between, there is a struggle between these two natures where we learn to walk in the Spirit, where gradually, sometimes in, 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 imperceptibly, we learn to say yes to Christ, to take the leading of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, to allow our minds to be renewed by Scripture, to have our, our thinking changed, our beliefs changed, so as we come to know Christ better. As we've been seeing, as we've been going through James, to not react to the Bible by saying, oh, I don't want to hear that. Let me, let me kind of interact and criticize that. Or let me just be downright angry with that. But rather that we hear the word of God, we bow the knee and we change, and we allow the word of God to transform our lives. So that, not that we become a Christian and the next day we totally stop sinning, but that we become a Christian and day by day, as we walk with Christ, as we spend time in our word, as we get equipped at church, as we minister one to another, as people minister to us, as we serve other people, that we all grow together so that these sins that so entangle us and, and, and infest us can be untangled and removed bit by bit. But the Paul... What Paul is correcting here is this idea that sin is just something that we have to get rid of the consequences of. The Christian message is so much greater than that. Verse 5 he says, 
For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Do you understand the way that he is rhetorically arguing here? He's saying if you've died with him, then you know you're going to be resurrected with him. He, he's, he's giving emphasis and encouragement to something that people might doubt. People are saying, well, I'm just sinning and sinning and sinning and sinning. I'm forgiven, right? Paul says, you've got this completely wrong. You're free. You don't have to keep on sinning. They said, like, what? Are you sure about that, Paul? And Paul says, if you've died with him, if that price that he paid is for you, then just as much as you can be assured of the forgiveness that comes with his death, you can be assured of the power that comes with his resurrection. Let me say that again. If we're Christians, we are, we are trusting in the fact that his death pays the price for our sin. If you can believe that you are dying to sin with him, then how much more so should you believe also that you are associated with his resurrection and that you have the power? If you don't have the, the power to live a holy life, then you don't have the forgiveness from sin. You can't have forgiveness from sin and not have the power for the, the, the resurrection power. Now when we say resurrection power, we don't mean those wacky TV evangelists, resurrection power and all that kind of stuff and, you know, getting people to, you know, get up out of wheelchairs and all of that. That's, that's not what we're talking about. I, have a, I used to have a friend when I was, uh, when I was a teenager, I went to one of those, those kind of wacky rallies, you know. And my, my friend who came with us, uh, it was a Benny Hinn rally, just so I name names and shame people who should be shamed. But there was uh, a friend of mine who came with us, and he, uh, he was on a crutch. He, he, he was playing football. That's what we do in England. It involves feet and balls. I believe you call it soccer, erroneously. But he was playing football, and um, he twisted his ankle. He, he just got a little strain on his ankle. So he was, he was hobbling around on a crutch. So the very nice people who were the stewards saw him come in and say, Oh, sir, look at you with your, your poor crutch and, you know, hobbling around. That must be very hard for you. You don't want to have to... Where, where are you sitting? Oh, you're, that's upstairs. Your ticket's upstairs. You don't want to go upstairs on your crutch. I'll tell you what, let, come and sit in this wheelchair and we'll give, you a, we'll give you a seat near the front. And so there the rest of us are up in our, with our group from church, up on, the, up, up on the balcony, looking up above in this big arena and then he's like oh anybody needs healing and all of this kind of stuff and then we suddenly see our buddy being wheeled onto the stage and he says come on take a step and you know he's he's got thousands what's he going to do he's got thousands of people watching him he's not going to say well, well you know nothing wrong with me he's, he's, he, he does what he's told and he gets up and takes a few steps and you can see his ankles not liking it one little bit but uh, for 99 percent of that arena they've just seen a miracle this guy's just gotten out of a wheelchair i tell you what a whole bunch of people from our church that night who had their faith shattered when they saw the the fake charlatans at work no no, no that's not resurrection power Resurrection power is this. You have a tendency to be impatient. And Jesus starts to change it. You have a tendency to only think of yourself. And Jesus starts to change it. You have a tendency and you're prone to anger. And Jesus starts to change it. You have a tendency to not love your spouse as much as you love yourself. And Jesus starts to change it. You have a tendency to... Um, to... Con Devote your life to the things that please you rather than the things that please God. And Jesus starts to change it. That's resurrection power right there. When Moses went to Pharaoh and he threw down his staff and his staff turned into a snake, Pharaoh's magicians said, oh, we can do that. And they got their staffs and they turned them into snakes as well. I'm not impressed by somebody who says, get up and walk, and they get up and walk, I'm impressed by somebody whose life is changed by the power of Jesus Christ. Because that, my friends, is resurrection power. And what Paul is saying here is he's saying, if we're united with him in death, if we're trusting in his death for our forgiveness, then we have to see that logically we must also be associated with him in his resurrection. And that means 
resurrection power, the glory of the Father, and newness of life. And so he says in verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. That's the message. When, when we are united with him in death, when our old self is crucified with him, so to speak, then our body of sin, the sin that's in our body, is brought to nothing. What does that mean? It means its power is removed. If you only have your sinful nature, then all you have is sin. You have no other choice. Everything that you do, when you give money to charity, when you help somebody go out, when you do something kind, everything that you do is tainted by sin, even the things that outwardly look good. But when you're saved, when you're baptized in his death, then that body of sin is brought to nothing. It's no longer in control. It's no longer in charge because now there is a new nature, a new spirit, a new way of living. And so we are no longer enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. When we die, then we won't be able to do a bunch of things anymore. And one of them is sin. And what Paul is telling us is that our death to sin, our spirit, that, that death in the spiritual realm has already happened. Just like a marriage ends with divorce, our relationship with sin as our master has now ended that has been severed by the death of Christ. And that's why where with the baptism service there is this association of going into the water and going under and that is death and then coming up to resurrection. And what we're saying is this, we're not saying that those who get baptized won't sin anymore. We're not saying that we're perfect. What we're saying is, is that we recognize that the slavery to sin has been broken and we now have a new life. How are we going to live that new life? Will we continue to live instinctively, following the habit patterns, living according to what we desire, what, we, what, we, what prompts we have? So many people, we think we're so freaking civilized and we're just Pavlov's dog. You know Pavlov's dog? You remember, did you learn that at school? Well, what he did is he fed the dog. And every time he fed the dog, he rang the bell. He brought the dog's food out. There you are. Ding, 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 ding. And he brought the dog's food out. Ding, 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 ding. And eventually, he just went ding, ding, ding. And the dog started salivating. That's Pavlov's dog. And we're like that. We're like a dog. We're just like, oh, I hear a bell. I'm hungry. I'm going to really focus. I'm going to really focus. Squirrel! You know, we just... We're just, we're just these instinctive beings where we, just, where we just function in whatever feels natural and right. And the Bible calls that sin. That, that, we, we gloss that up. In our world today, that is called following your heart. That's what it's called. And it sounds good, and it sounds really inspired, and really deep, man. And even a little bit spiritual. But Jeremiah tells us that our hearts are deceitful and wicked. So not only are our hearts bent on wickedness, but they deceive us in their wickedness so that we think that we're pursuing good things when all we're pursuing is wickedness. And so to follow our hearts is not a very good idea at all. So what the world calls following your heart, the Bible calls being enslaved to sin. The joy of the Christian message is not that we can live our lives and find forgiveness at the end. The joy of the Christian message is that we are no longer slaves to sin. We no longer have to follow our heart and our instinctive motivations, but rather we can allow scripture to renew our minds change our way of thinking, and empowered by God's Holy Spirit, 
who indwells us, we can live lives for the glory of God, being sanctified and purified day by day as we seek after him. So I hope that on this Baptism Sunday, we all once again make that commitment. Let's leave behind the past. Let's leave behind our old hearts, our old way of thinking, our old life, and let us live for the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of Scripture. I pray that we would, we would first of all, acknowledge that you have freed us from the power of sin. I pray that we might dive into Scripture, that we might learn what is good and what is true and what is right in contrast to what is wrong and what is wicked and what is false. And I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would prompt us and empower us to walk the way of your word, to walk in wisdom, true heavenly wisdom. Pray that we wouldn't quench your Holy Spirit, silencing him, choosing to live a way that we know is wrong, again and again and again, until we fail to see the wrongness that we once saw. But our lives will go in the other direction. And we will become ever more aware of the sin in our hearts and walk away from that sin and live lives that are ever-changing. Lives that are becoming more conformed to your word, more similar to Christ, and bring you more glory. Amen. Mm -hmm.